This time it's five overrated motorcycles, part two. Okay, so just to be clear, the motorcycles in this video are actually really good motorcycles. No one is saying that they're bad bikes. But the fact is, they've been placed on a pedestal so high that no machine could actually match up to it. And this has unfortunately led to them being very overpriced in the marketplace. So we're going to look at these bikes and also consider what alternatives there are for the canny buyer. The Ducati 750 SS. The original 750 Supersport with that bevel drive engine is a fabulous machine to behold. It's very beautiful, sounds sensational, and by the standards of the day, it was a real mover. But Ducati at that time was not the company that it is today. It was very small, so it's a very low production bike, hence prices are extraordinarily high. But also, at the time, the bike didn't sell particularly well simply because, well, the usual Italian problems sloppy build quality, terrible chrome and electrics and the reliability of the early V-Twins wasn't exactly fantastic. And to be honest, if we were going into a video that talks about all the engine problems that they had, it would be a full length video, and we simply don't have time for that. Suffice to say, the bike gave a lot of trouble. The bike is often described as the most significant bike ever built at Ducati, because it essentially saved the company, which at least in part is true. But really, if you're looking for the most significant Ducatis ever, well, in terms of V-Twins, it would definitely be the belt drive Panthers which in reality are the true ancestors of all the modern Ducatis that we see on the road today. In reality, Ducati really struggled in the marketplace during the 1970s. Build quality really didn't help, and it took them a long time to really get on top of their production problems. And it wasn't really until the 860 GTS that we start to see a much more reliable Ducati. This is, however, a truly gorgeous machine. But for the canny buyer, there are more sensible alternatives. The 900 DeMar came along a few years later, and is very beautiful and a bit more reliable than those early 750s and can be picked up for a lot less money. But if you really want a piece of history, look no further than the Panther 500 and 650 models, the true ancestors of modern Ducatis. Kawasaki Z1 Kawasaki Z1 first arrived in 1972 and is notable for being the first mass-produced Japanese motorcycle to use double overhead cams. The real standout point of the Z1 is that awesome motor. A little over 900 cc's and 82 brake horsepower was an almost unheard of figure back in 72. It was way faster than pretty much anything else in production at that time. And its strength and durability is truly legendary. The bike was used extensively in drag racing and proved to be one of the toughest motorcycle engines ever built. But unfortunately for the canny buyer, the bike has become somewhat iconic. What this basically means is it's become very expensive, particularly for early models. And of course, like any motorcycle, it's not without its little imperfections. The chassis simply can't cope with that enormous power. Let's face it, it really did take the Japanese a good few years to get to grips with handling and suspension dynamics. The other big problem with the bike was the sitting position. It was designed really for the American market and even in the European market the bike arrived with bars that were simply too high and foot pegs that were simply too far forward. This would have been a pretty good sitting position had you been on something like an old Triumph but with an 82 horsepower absolute manic monster like the Z1 you very quickly turned into a human parachute and those high bars didn't help with feel either and again this had a very negative effect on the handling. The fact is, as fast as it was, showing a twisty road, a much less powerful machine could really show you a clean pair of heels. Kawasaki did, of course, improve the handling over the production run of the machine, so a later bike is probably a better choice than an earlier one in reality, even though they're actually a bit less pricey. Sensible alternatives to the bike would be, let's say, a GS1000 Suzuki, a very good chassis and an equally bulletproof engine. But if you really hanker after Kawasaki, a really great choice is the Z650. It's smaller, lighter and more nimble, and that punchy 650 engine develops an awful lot more torque than you might think. It makes a fantastic road bike, and perhaps a better choice for most riders on modern roads. 
a truly excellent machine and one that I would definitely recommend. The BMW R90S The R90S is BMW's first real sports model and perhaps their most iconic. Produced between 1973 and 1976, which is, when you think about it, is a relatively short production run for such an iconic machine. Styled by designer Hans Muff, it's one of the first motorcycles to use a bikini fairing, and this really adds a unique feel to this machine, and gives reasonable wind protection at high speed too. The engine produces a claimed 67 horsepower, which is said to be good enough for around 124 miles an hour, which was going some by 1973 standards and this power is fed through a 5-speed gearbox. Again, like all the other bikes on the list, it's become something of an icon. And this of course has pushed prices up somewhat. This is a little strange when you think about it, because the Fouser model which followed on is actually less expensive to buy now second hand, and yet produces slightly more power and a good bit more mid-range torque. As with all BMWs of the era, the one thing that holds handling back a little bit is perhaps slightly over soft front suspension. This is BMW and they do like to provide a nice comfy ride you understand. So some porpoising can be experienced if you push on a bit too hard on these bikes. For me, really great alternatives to this bike would be, let's say a Moto Guzzi Le Mans which offers similar styling but a little bit more machismo. Or if it has to be a BMW, my choice would be the R100 RS. This bike is even more pioneering than the R90S because it's one of the first bikes to really make successful use of a full ferry. A real game changer in terms of sports touring. And yet strangely today, doesn't fetch the same prices that the R90 does. Honda's CBX 1000 The late 70s and early 80s was really an era of newfound confidence in the motorcycle industry and this is where you find some truly outlandish machines being designed and built. Few of these bikes however more so than Honda's mighty CBX 1000. That's right, dual overhead cams and six cylinders in a row. And it's that mighty engine that really dominates proceedings. It's wide, although not actually that much wider than a typical four cylinder engine of the period, but nevertheless a little bit wider and you really do see these six exhausts and mighty things sticking out either side as one of these bikes powers by. The engine noise is truly intoxicating, a six sounds absolutely fantastic. It's also the first production bike to claim to produce over 100 horsepower, 105 horsepower was what Honda claimed at the time. All this added up to truly unheard of performance and smoothness. But the bike never sold in particularly great numbers. I think only around 24 to 25,000 machines were ever actually completed. And it's fairly obvious to see why. It's a large, heavy beast. And although the performance is excellent, it was blooming expensive at the time. And as a second hand bike, it remained very expensive. And this is not helped at all by the extremely complex engine. Spare parts for the bike are extremely expensive, not surprisingly. But overall, this is a truly awesome machine. But the big question is, does the extraordinary sound that it makes really justify the extra expense that you have to go through compared to say a four cylinder bike of the same era? Alternatives would be Kawasaki's even more ludicrous Z13 or the Benelli Sei, which actually beat the CBX into production as the world's first mass produced six cylinder motorcycle. But the asking price for any of these six cylinder machines today is going to be very high. So if you put on your sensible shoes, and you should ask yourself, would you be better off simply buying a classic four cylinder machine? And in reality, your bank balance almost certainly would. So is the extraordinary exhaust whale worth the extra expense? I suppose that's very much down to personal taste. The Harley Davidson Fat Boy. Fat Boy is probably best remembered as Arnie's ride in Terminator 2. This is an absolute monster of a motorcycle. Lots of torque, although of course not that much top end power, and even more weight. 
But for me, the fat boy is emblematic of what is wrong with Harley Davidson. And that is quite simply that they are the non-motorcyclist choice of motorcycle. This is a bike that appeals to non-bikers. Ask any man in the street who knows nothing about motorcycles to name a motorcycle and he will immediately say Harley Davidson. This is of course fantastic marketing by Harley Davidson, but it doesn't necessarily mean that the machines are quite as good as people expect them to be. And the reputations of Harley Davidson over the years have become somewhat inflated. But in reality what you're getting is a very pricey cruiser bike that's very overweight and doesn't actually perform that well. Like most Harley Davidsons, the fat boy has terrible ground clearance, so show it a corner and you're very quickly going to run out of ground clearance. The engine is massive, isn't fuel efficient and very old fashioned, and dare I say rather crude. Again, fairly typical of Harley Davidsons. For me, Harleys are just too darn big and don't justify their huge size or expense. Thankfully, as the engine has evolved over the years, it's gained balance shafts, so at least it's much smoother now than it was back in the old days. But this is nevertheless a fairly old fashioned design in reality. For me, the best Harley Davidsons are the Sportsters. They are a much more sensible size, but are strangely looked down on by other Harley Davidson owners. So, what would be my sensible shoes suggestions? Well, quite simply, if it must be a Harley Davidson, I'd go for a 1200 Sportster. Much less expensive. It's much better if you show at a corner, although again ground clearance is not fantastic, but a more sensible alternative nonetheless. If it must be American, then of course as Indian, although again these are very expensive machines, but are often much more modern than the Harley equivalents. But if you really want to go for the alternative choice, why not go for Motor Guts's California? I know most people are going to dismiss this, but the fact is in the late 80s, American Motorcycle Magazine voted the Cali the best cruiser bike available. OK, so the 1100 engine doesn't have the punch of a big Harley, but it doesn't have the weight either. It's still a large bike, it's very comfortable, it's smoother, and above all, it corners like no Harley could ever dream of. So if you're running on a budget, it may make a good choice. And of course, there's what Americans like to call metric cruisers. Any number of Japanese companies will supply a perfectly reasonable cruiser, which is probably going to be more reliable than the real thing. Shh, I didn't say that out loud, did I? In truth, Harley Davidson is a company about which I have fairly mixed feelings. We did own Harley Davidson for a few years, and I quite liked riding it. It was quite fun, it was very involving to ride, but the ground clearance was absolutely rubbish. Showed a decent roundabout, and sparks begin to fly very quickly, and I'm not a fast rider at all. It was also blooming heavy, it was blooming expensive, although it was very beautiful, but it was surprisingly crude too for a notionally modern motorcycle. And in fact the ride quality was probably worse than on my 1954 BSA, which is saying something really, isn't it? In the end my wife replaced the bike with a V7 Gutsy, which was smaller, lighter and far more nimble. And in the end, with that larger tank, was a far more practical machine when you were covering large miles. I think one of the most disappointing aspects of a lot of Harley Davidsons is that a bike which should be capable of covering huge miles easily is hampered by a tiny gas tank. As Tom repeatedly asked me while we were touring through France, why does mum have to keep pulling over? Because she's run out of gas again, Tom. That's why. Well, I do hope you enjoyed that video. What bikes do you think are overrated on today's market, whether they be modern or classic machines? Please comment below. And do remember that the bikes featured here are all excellent motorcycles. But like all motorcycles, they're not without the faults. And in many cases, the asking price doesn't really justify the product that you get in the end. There are alternatives out there for the sensible buyer. And sensible does not mean boring. All motorcycles are enjoyable. The idea that you need to spend a fortune to enjoy yourself on a motorcycle is complete nonsense. So I do hope you enjoyed that video. If you did, don't forget to like and subscribe. And of course, thank you very much for watching. And we'll see you next time.